Hello everyone, it's me, Monet Exchange. We are here for a very special Pride Month panel with these lovely and amazing foundations, Harvey Milk, P Flag, Human Rights Campaign, and also Outright. I'm very excited, it's gonna be very fun. I am Monet Exchange. My pronouns are she, her, hers, he, him, his. I live in the binary and I'm proud of it. So I want us all to go around and just say your name, your foundation, and what your pronouns are. My name's Diego Miguel Sanchez. My pronouns are he, him, and. Hi, I'm Miriam Richter with the Harvey Foundation. My pronouns are she, her, hers. We, we actually threw, threw you a loop, Monet, by, by both being on here. But let me just say I'm Stuart Milk. Um, I'm with the Harvey Milk Foundation. My pronouns are he, him. And actually, I'm pretty open to anything. I've been called everything in the book, and I'm cool with it. Hi, I'm Alfonso David. I am the president of the Human Rights Campaign. My pronouns are him, he, him, his. Big gorgeous Maria. Well, thank you. My name is Maria Sherin. I'm deputy director of Outright Action International. And my pronouns are they and she. Awesome. So I think I first want to go around and find out um, how did you all become involved um, with your organization and the cause? And um, what moved you to be an advocate for the LGBTQ community rights and equality. Maria, you want to kick us off? Sure. Uh, I mean, I first uh, joined an organization during Pride uh, over 20 years ago because I wanted to make new friends. But I quickly realized that there's a lot to do to ensure that all of us have the right to be who we are. And that's why I'm passionate about working for a global organization to help accelerate the pace of change. Because we all know there's a lot of resistance to change. And if we work in solidarity, uh, we can make that change happen uh, faster all over the globe. Alfonso? Hi, I've been involved in the civil rights movement for quite some time, uh, about 20 years. I've been litigating cases uh, at Lambda Legal. I was in government for a while. I entered into the advocacy space specifically to help marginalized communities and advance equality and justice for all. It's kind of interesting, you know, I actually um, uh, came out the night my uncle was assassinated um, and uh, I was in college in Washington, D.C. And, um, and Frank Kameny, who was an uh, activist, uh, one of our founders and founding fathers of activism in D.C., asked me to speak. Um, and for those of us who knew Frank, you probably wouldn't be surprised that he told me, oh, my God, you're nothing like your uncle. Don't do that again. And that devastated me for about five years because <laughs> I thought, I'm, oh, I'm always going to be compared to Harvey. But, um, but I, I did stay with it, and I actually went to the women's rights movement and then, uh, and then obviously got involved in LGBT rights. Diego. Thank you so much. Well, I got involved because when I was five years old, I told my parents I was born wrong. And my parents left the room. My mom oh. came back, had something in her hand. And I thought I was going to get a spanking, but she just unrolled a magazine. They had a picture of Christine Jorgensen on the cover. And said, I don't know if it's okay for people like you who want to grow up. There. But this woman was born to be a heavy person. So if it's okay for her, by the time you go up, it'll be okay for you. That was 61, which was 12 years before people was born. So I've been active in the movement for 40 years and for <laughs> Thank you, Diego. Um, and this is kind of a question to everyone here. I think I just want to take a minute to talk about um, uh, uh, with all the racial violence and protests and police brutality to just check in on the black and minority LGBTQ plus community and how do we see that they are doing? Maria? Sure. I mean, uh, since I work for Outright, which is a global organization, we see this from so many different angles. Uh, we see, of course, right now, uh, how the protests across the U.S. are actually amplified around the world. But, I mean, make no mistake, like, racism and the heritage of colonialism affect people around the globe and make marginalized people mm -hmm. even more marginalized. So it's definitely, it's a global, it's a global pandemic racist and we need to fight it as such. Alfonso, as, as you being someone who is 
who 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 is a who is a black man? How 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 do you see the issue at large? The issue of racial justice generally. Yes, and but but the intersectionality with that and the LGBTQ plus community. Well, I I think for all too long we have seen them as separate movements, and I think to our detriment because what it does is further marginalizes people of color. If you're a person of color and you also have to be LGBTQ, often you are forced to choose uh, which movement you're going to be a part of and which issues you're going to care about. Yeah. And that actually further marginalizes people of color. So I think what we are currently experiencing in this country is an inflection point where people are actually seeing the issues that affect people of color in a very different way, and specifically black people who have faced racial oppression, yeah. faced police brutality, and I'm heartened to see that many members of the LGBTQ community are now recognizing that that struggle is directly intertwined with the LGBTQ plus group. Uh, we, we, we have seen legislative advances to promote equality, non-discrimination, and protections of, of LGBTQ plus individuals in the U.S. However, our community still faces lack of official protection in many states federally. How can the LGBTQ community and advocates work together to help secure laws that protect the rights of LGBTQ individuals? So I'll say in answering that question, first, we received a landmark ruling yesterday from the U.S. Supreme Court, and that ruling essentially affirms that LGBTQ people are protected from discrimination in the workplace. Essentially, under Title VII, which is a federal statute, it prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. And the court interpreted sex to include sexual orientation and gender identity. That decision affirms what we've known for the past 20 years, that LGBTQ people are indeed protected under federal law. But your point is well taken. In 29 states in this country, there are no state law protections. So we need people to engage to make sure that we have effective state law protections as well. In terms of our constitutional construct, the federal government provides the floor. States can provide greater protection. So in many states, they provide more comprehensive protections than the federal government does. But unfortunately, in 29 states, there are no protections. And so what we are doing is pushing state legislatures to pass comprehensive legislation for LGBTQ people. We were successful most recently in Virginia where we worked to uh, enact mm. pro-equality legislature in Virginia. For the very first time, we have a pro-equality Senate and we have a pro-equality House of Delegates in the Commonwealth of Virginia, the Amazing. first time in the history of Virginia. And as a result of that, they passed comprehensive non-discrimination protections for LGBTQ people, the first such legislation in the entire South. So I would say if folks want to get involved, they should volunteer. They can volunteer at the Human Rights Campaign. We do political work, we do advocacy work. They can also contact their, the members of the state legislature where they live to lobby them and engage them as to why protections on the state level is so important. And I would say they can also advocate for additional protections with their congressional representatives because they represent their interests as well. Thank you. And this is, this is to you, Maria. I mean, and, and as, as Alfonso was saying, we, we have seen advancements locally, but obviously internationally, there is a disparity when you think about places like Chechnya and in Russia. So, uh, so, how, so how can we advocate from in the U.S. to those places internationally? I mean, I think there are a few different things. Like outright, we do a lot of work at the United Nations because when people have no recourse or they have no access to governments in their own countries, they need someplace else to go. Uh, and what happens is actually countries influence each other. So, I mean, the decision from the U.S. Supreme Court yesterday, it's going to have an influence across the world. And we saw in the decision mm -hmm. in India a couple of years ago that decriminalized same-sex relationships for you know over a billion people that they quoted a UN document in several places, including uh, actually a paragraph that Outright had originally written. So we can make change mm -hmm. and have ripple effects. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, of course, there is something that corporations and, and companies can do as well. I mean, many of them are global mm -hmm. and they should also speak up and be visible and ensure that they promote inclusion uh, across the countries where they work. 
This is to you, Diego. Um, you know, we all know COVID nineteen has is, is is a global pandemic. It has dev it has devastated the world. But we see that there are a lot um, the black community, but also the, also the LGBTQ community. It has affected us disproportionately. Um, um, what is your organization's approach to addressing the needs and issues of LGBTQ people affected? That is such an important question to raise, Renee. Thank you so much. At P Flag, we yeah. operate in three areas. One has to do with support, so the support groups we do across the country in every little zip code. Also, education, helping schools get right, helping libraries get right, places being welcoming LGBTQ people, including we of color, including myself, who's an immigrant as well, and adopt. The third area is that. So what we've done for COVID-19 is that we have is a big like which has given remote access through Zoom to all of our chapters for them to do their meetings remotely. What we've found is that they picked up people in rural areas who may have had no support and are finding that they can connect them. In addition to that, we've done very strong advocacy to make sure that we are letting legislators in the administration know where funding needs to occur to, to fight for making COVID-19 history and also making people safer. We know that the LGBTQ people plus people of color, Native Americans, API people, Latinos, African Americans are more, more disproportionately affected by COVID-19 than others. So it is our issue across the board. And to, to, to Stuart and Miriam, you know, I mean, you, you, your, your organization obviously has worked a lot to advance the message of inclusion and equality and civil rights. What are some new challenges as we are well, not approaching, we are in a new decade that, uh, that, that, that we can start to focus on in the LGBTQ community? Well, you know, I think, I think that the, I actually say that they're the same challenges that we've had. Um, so um, I think we, we, we can look at some of the challenges in a new way, but two key points, especially for our work at the Harvey Milk Foundation is visibility and self-interest. So, I mean, it, for instance, the, the major ruling that we had um, uh, under the Atherdahl case, um, Justice Bader Ginsburg was asked if this would have happened earlier. And she said, no, because she knows some justices who only recently got to personally know LGBT people. And we know around the world that that's the case. Um, uh, Maria mentioned India. When India recriminalized, they actually recriminalized eight years ago their LGBT community. Um, when they did that, I got to speak with some of the Supreme Court justices in, uh, in the, uh, uh, who had recriminalized, and they told me I, we wouldn't do it if we had LGB. They didn't recriminalize the T because third gender people are known in India. She said, we have them. So it's the message that my uncle gave his life for. It's that message of visibility. When you know personally LGBT people, then all the lies, myths, and innuendos about LGBTQ people are destroyed. And that's, the, and that's done by everyday heroes who have those difficult kitchen table conversations with their parents. Um, like, uh, you know, like all of us here have had at some point with someone in our life. And then the second point is, is self-interest. And let me tell you, I was 25, and this really points to the moment, I think, in the time where we are today. I got to go to Nairobi, Kenya, to the closing conference for the UN Decade for Women. And um, I was working in the women's rights movement, and I met someone who has become a friend, her name is Lila Watson. She opened that conference. Most people had my colored skin there, but Lila was an Aboriginal leader, still is in Australia. And she opened the conference saying, look, if you've come here because you wanna help women, if you've come here because you wanna help people of color, if you've come here because you wanna help indigenous people, pack up your bags, go home. We have nothing to do together. And you could hear a pin drop, those 3,000 people just sat there. I mean, they traveled thousands of miles. They sat there with their mouth open and she let that silence hang there. And then she said, but if you've come here because you understand that your liberation is bound with mine, then let us work together. If you're, if you, and we have to understand that, that our liberation is bound together and we need to do it out of a self-interest. So whether 
whether it's someone being brutalized because of the color of their skin or someone being persecuted because they have a faith that's a minority, we are all, it's in our self-interest that that does not happen. And so even though we are at this important moment in time, I think that message still has to get out there. It is in all of our self-interest that nobody is treated unfairly, that no one is treated unequally, that no one is marginalized. And I think that that message needs to continue. Mm -hmm. Now, a bit, something that we've all talked about here, are we, we've been touching on like the big picture policies and like big things we can do to advocate, to, advocate, to advocate for change. But for someone who may be watching this program now, who may not be LGBTQ, can you guys talk about how, like what being a good ally looks like? And also, for people who may be queer, sometimes queer people need to know how to advocate for each other as well. Can you talk about what that is and how that looks like, Alfonso? Well, I, I, I've said recently that I think it's important for us to really rethink how we're using our power um, and how we appear. Uh, I understand that we often talk about allies, and I think that's very important. But I would suggest that we start thinking more in terms of advocacy. Um, there's a difference between serving as an ally and serving as an advocate. And I think it's important for non-LGBTQ people to serve as advocates for LGBTQ people, or for non-marginalized community to serve as advocates for marginalized community. In large companies all over this country, we know that racial minorities are in the minority. And in many instances, they face microaggressions, they face racial discrimination, or they may just face oppressive policies and practices. They are often the ones who have to stand up. They are often the ones who have to rise up to say, this is wrong. And if we have others who are stepping up, who are standing up and rising up to say, I saw what happened and I think that is not consistent with our values, that is not consistent with our policies, then we have true advocates who are advancing justice, who are advancing equality for all. So I've been thinking more about how we restructure and sort of deconstruct this concept of allies and think more in the concept of advocacy. Maria or Diego or Stuart? Anyone? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I'll go ahead. Go ahead, Maria. I'll go after you. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Diego. I mean, I think one of the things. Sorry, thank y'all. By the way, thank y'all for sticking through this. This is so difficult. This is so crazy. But thank y'all for being patient. All good. All okay, go ahead, Maria. Uh, absolutely. Sorry. I mean, I think one is one thing is to think globally. Uh, we touched a little bit about the COVID pandemic and its effect, uh, as Diego has as noted in the U.S. But we see. Uh, so many harsh effects uh, to our LGBTIQ communities around the globe. So Outright in Response launched an emergency fund to respond to it. And we have seen like so many people stepping up to support it with, with gifts and by sharing that information. And I think that these are things that people are not necessarily thinking of. It's like everyone is, of course, like it's, and I think it's driven also by the pandemic. Everyone is very locally focused. But I really want to encourage people to think globally, to learn more, to share that information uh, so that more people are aware of what the situation is like globally. That's, that's really what I would want to see from allies and our own communities uh, both. So at PFLAG, which we're the, we're the nation's largest organization of LGBTQ allies, parents, families, and people who are aware of themselves, we say that ally is a verb. Don't be an ally, but ally with them. And we find that, you know, like Maria was saying, even globally, six years ago, we had, had or built a lot of people in Uganda because of this. And they were telling us how difficult that they wanted us to help them create an LGBT organization. And we said we are driven by people, not here to ally, to use the verb. If you can pull some parents or family, who are not who will stand with you, come back. Well, they have, and they have tremendous people, like in Africa and in other parts of the world. But we think that people must make it a verb, not be a just verb. And it's true across all cultures and all ethnicities. Because the truth is, when we're looking for things that are LGBTQ people, just as we do it, myself, you know, or anyone that's an African guy or native person, 
there's usually a room with power, more people who don't look like us than who do. So we need to make sure that we're mobilizing people like them to join with us and treat it like a person. And, um, and to add into that, um, uh, and maybe tie it together, you know, um, I think it's very important um, that we see ourselves as being global citizens, as Maria mentioned, and that we also do not think so American centric. Um, the reason I say that, um, mm -hmm. we just came off of the fourth anniversary of the massacre at Pulse, which is very close to me because I'm close to the Orlando community. and and. The, and, and our global community, both LGBT and allied, had an immediate response, which was this eloquent response of, of wonderful, from, from all corners of the globe, standing with the community. But one of the things that I said that got lost in it, and that was a little, that was really upsetting to me, I had just come from Cuernavaca, where we did our first national meeting of, of LGBT activists in Mexico. And a month before Pulse, 19 young people were killed at Grandma's Bar outside of uh, outside of Cuernavaca. Nobody was reporting on that. Nobody felt the outrage. Um, why? I mean, these were wow. 19 incredible souls who were killed um, a month yeah. before Pulse. And so as much as I am uh, in favor of us um, uh, memorizing and memorializing those that we lost at Pulse. We lose people all over the world. We have incidents like that that happen all over the world, and we must stand together as a community. And this is not just for LGBT people or attacked. Any minority that has that type of an assault, we should be having uh, a global community that speaks with one voice. Love that. Thank you, Stuart. Um, one thing I do want to, I know we're getting close to time. Uh, Look, now that we are in June and this is Pride Month, you have lots of people who, because of COVID-19, lots of people who don't know what to do, how to celebrate, like what, how they can, how they, how they can lend their voice in when they, when people are still social distancing and not being able to go to Pride parades. How, what is, how can you advise young folk or people who don't know what to do in this month um, to still be prideful and to still uh, share the sentiments of Pride Month? Uh, Maria, Alfonso. <laughs> Maria, why don't you go and I'll I'll go after you. Sure. I mean, don't we all uh, just uh, go to social media? Isn't that what we all do? Like you said, young people. <laughs> so I mean, I think that me and my age, you know, I'm on Facebook, but I mean, other people are on Instagram yeah. or Snapchat. I think that I mean, finding community seriously is is what we need to do in times like these. And that's where I think that I'll be turning and I think a lot of other people should be turning. Yeah. Yeah. I would say for pride for young people, it's important for us to learn from our history. Uh, many, I don't want to just say it's limited to young people, but I think many of us within the LGBTQ community may not be aware that we had a movement because of black and Latinx transgender women who fought against police brutality in California and New York, from Compton's Cafe, Cafe to Black Cat to Stonewall. We have a modern LGBTQ civil rights movement because of those women, because of transgender and gender nonconforming people who fought against police brutality. So in this time, this difficult time where we are unable to convene, where we're unable to march and participate in pride the way we normally do, I would suggest taking a look back and thinking about our history and having it inform how we think about our advocacy moving forward. And hopefully that sparks uh, some young people or others to really engage in the movement more actively. I, I really think that for young people, the most important thing during pride is to, to be safe, to be safe, and to make sure that if they're in their families, it's safe. And if it's not safe, find a way through social media to get safe. The other thing is mothers of Stonewall, um, I'm probably older than I look, but they were my friends. And literally, uh, and, and I think about what today we can do. One thing that we all do well, if we sit with ourselves, our flag, we believe in the power we know everyone's going to need to vote. We hope they vote every time that they've got a ballot near them. 
to encourage everyone around them to do that, but also to make sure that you're telling your story because there's so many legislators all they need to know. It's how your family is affected and that can connect with them because they have a family. So pride is about strength. It's also about resistance, but it's also about community and community. Um, so as we are on the last, as, as we're closing out, the last thing I want to say is if you had one call of action to people watching this broadcast or people who may watch it later or who may watch it five years from now, what is your one call to action that you would say? Let's start with Stuart and Mary. Well, I, I mean, I, the, it's, it's what I said before. It's why my uncle gave his life is, is, is to be visible. Um, so is to um, be an everyday hero. You don't have to be, I mean, my uncle said it best. You don't have to be marching in the streets. You don't have to be, you need to be authentic. You need to take off your mask and you need to stand up. You know, we. I tell people all the time that they can be sheroes and heroes by simply standing up to bullies on a playground in a corporate suite. Um, anytime you hear a sexist, a xenophobic, a racist remark, you're standing up for our community because they are members, because that we are we are all interconnected. The LGBT community is every race, every faith, every political background. Um, you can be an everyday hero and everyday shiro. And so stand up um, whenever you hear, now, you know, we've got people like Alfonso and we've got people like, um, Diego, who can take on the bullies that may be sitting in Pennsylvania Avenue. We're not asking everyone to do that, but we've got bullies that, you know, that we can see in our everyday life. And if we all speak up, then those bullies lose their power. They lose their voice. They can't separate and divide. We stand together. Uh, I would also like to add, talking about history, is hear those words from Harvey himself. Um, if you're looking for something to do at home, rent the Times of Harvey Milk, hear his speeches, see how what he accomplished. It's, it's something also a lot of the younger generation of our community does not know who Harvey is. And we need to remember history because otherwise we are doomed to repeat it. And that's something very easy that people can do and they can learn. And Harvey, Stewart has totally inherited the same genes that Harvey had. But, but to hear Harvey give his speeches is very, very empowering. And I would say, yeah. not just to look in our community. I mean, Cesar Chavez is one of my heroes who worked intersectionally. And I think the one thing I would say, not be out, but be, be out if it's safe. That would be my one thing, because some of us don't mind risking our lives every day, but some kids are in danger in their own homes. And we owe it to them, not to ask them to, to risk it all, but to save themselves so that the rest of us can make tomorrow the world that deserves that we need. Uh, I would say use your voice. Um, there are so many ways that you can use your voice. Uh, one is voting. Make sure that your voice is heard at the ballot box. Make sure that you're holding your elected officials accountable. Make sure you're using your voice to rise up when you see oppression and discrimination. Make sure that you use your voice when you need to educate others who are not informed about LGBTQ oppression, are not in, informed about LGBTQ discrimination. Use your voice. I think we all have to remember our capacity and what our capacity is. And our voice is just a component of our capacity. So I would ask people to use your voices. Make sure that your voices are used for good and make sure your voices are used to further advance the movement for equality. I agree with everything that uh, the other distinguished panelists have said, but I also want to say that, I mean, I think have an intersectional approach. Like you can be, you can promote the rights of LGBTIQ people. You can be feminist. You can be anti-racist. You can be all of these things. You don't have to choose and just be one. Stand up for equality for everyone and think globally. That would be my call to action. I love that. Yeah, people think they can only do one thing, honey. You can have McDonald's, you can have Chipotle, you can have, you can have all the things. Do all of it. Thank you guys all so much for the chat and for this talk. I mean, I'm, I, I know someone will watch this. You guys have given us information and tools to hopefully go out into the world and be activists, and be allies for ourselves and to other people. 
intersectionally. LGBTQ, black, brown, purple, pink, or whatever. We can all be that. So thank you all so much. Happy thank Pride you. to all of you. Pride, everybody. And um, Alfonso and Diego, keep up the good work down there in DC. Let them have it. Stuart. <laughs> Mwah. Maria, thank you guys so much. Maria, thank you guys so much. Have a good day. And you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.